Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Institute of Aquaculture's Big Fish Series Seminar. And today we're talking about is governance the missing ingredient for sustainable aquaculture? Before we start, and while we wait for others to join, can I invite you to interact with us by using the Q&A box, please? And by all means, please reach out and use the chat function as well. Our panelists will do the best to address these questions in real time, and we'll have time later on in the seminar to follow up on some of the key issues arising with the panel. However, I do find that. OK, so my name is David Little and I'm at the Institute of Aquaculture, the University of Stirling, and I'll be hosting today's event. So they'll have, they'll Before we begin, I'd like to congratulate Dr. Shakuntila Tilsida Worldfish for just having been awarded the 2021 World Food, Food Prize. Um, that's for her influential work on nutrition, fish and aquatic food systems around the world. And I'm sure there's many people throughout the world who, who join me in congratulating her on that. Today, our panel will explore whether aquaculture governance is the missing ingredient to sustainable aquaculture. We'll start with a short video in which Simon Bush explores the role of governance in realizing the ambitions of the sector and introduces the aquaculture governance indicators, the AGI, as a framework for assessing performance of aquaculture governance around the world. We'll then hear brief perspectives and opinions from voices around the world from those whose lives are dependent on seafood. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Big Fish Seminar this afternoon, where we're going to be addressing the question, is governance the missing ingredient for sustainable aquaculture? Now, before addressing that question, I want to address another question, and that is, what is governance? Well, we see governance as a set of interactions between social, political and economic actors, which are taken to solve societal problems, but also to create societal opportunities around key issues, grand challenges like sustainability. It involves the formulation and application of norms, rules and principles to guide those interactions, but also to enable and control those interactions. Now, when we're talking about governance, it's important to make a distinction from government. Governance involves the state, governance involves the state, as well as the private sector and NGOs, for example, even community organisations. When we're talking about governance, we also want to really focus on issues of coverage, appropriateness and legitimacy. Coverage meaning who's included within a governance arrangement. Appropriateness meaning who is able to be included and deem or determine the goals that that governance arrangement should aim for. Who deems them as being appropriate goals? and legitimacy around those norms, rules, and principles that emerge, those people that are going to subject themselves to those rules, norms, and principles should indeed deem them as being legitimate. And finally, reflexivity. Information generated through these interactions should be shared, and that sharing of information should allow for people to reflect on whether those goals are being reached and to be able to change the new norms, rules and standards and their interactions and collaborations with other actors in a way that can shift their behaviour towards more sustainable practices. So when we think about governance in the aquaculture sector, I'm sure a number of organisations pop into your minds. Governments, for example, the United States and Vietnam as being two examples, of course, but other organisations, standard holders, the ASC, GAA and Naturland. Perhaps you're also thinking about organisations which share information like Fish Source, or perhaps you're thinking about other organisations, what we call meta-governance organisations like the Global Sustainable Seafood Initiative, GSSI, which creates norms for standards on behalf of retail members. You might also think of organisations like the Global Salmon Initiative, which is a pre-competitive partnership of large companies working in the salmon industry towards greater transparency and also setting goals for sustainability for that sector. Now, when we think of governance, we often think of these organisations independently and individually. But when we talk about governance and interactive governance, 
we really want to focus on the combination of public and private rules and organizations. In other words, how these organizations are collectively moving a sector towards a goal like sustainable aquaculture production. And that's not really focused on very much. Another thing or a tendency, let's say, within questions of aquaculture governance is a focus on the farm level instead of really the sector level. So what we argue is that limited attention to the performance of these public and private organizations and collectively addressing issues in a given sector, it's, it's, it's really a blind spot. And that's a blind spot that, uh, that we, we've tried to address. What's also missing essentially from a lot of discussions around aquaculture governance is a focus on capability and the capability of states, NGOs and standards and or the industry to foster the problem solving capacity needed for improvement in general, but also improvement towards compliance to rules, norms, standards, regulation in general. So when you see GSSI on the right here, what you can think of is as an organization that simply tries to align the ambitions of various companies working within the salmon sector. But when we talk about that role of organize, that organization within a governance context, we also need to think about how they interact with governments, how they foster and enable their companies to also engage with government and how both public and private actors across the board can collectively set goals, monitor and try to achieve uh, sustainability goals associated with complex problems like sea lice in that sector. In other words, we need a shift of thinking. And I would argue a shift of thinking away from questions of what are the rules, laws and standards and are producers compliant to those rules, laws and standards and instead move to questions around who has the capability to solve problems undermining sustainability and are the laws, standards and collaborations in a sector collectively enabling or undermining these capabilities and in doing so undermining the collective capacity of a sector to solve problems and move towards goals like sustainable production. That's really key to what we understand as governance. Now, what I'm also doing today is introducing a framework, a framework which we've called the Aquaculture Governance Indicators. In fact, this framework was released only last week and you can find all of this information on the website at the top left there, www.aquaculturegovernance.org. For the rest of the presentation, I just want to give you a flavour of what you might find there and the kind of questions and, and what, what components of the framework uh, we've put together. Now, before I do so, I want to give uh, a bit of an indication of where this has come from. Um, the team at Marketing University has collaborated with Seafood Watch, uh, as well as with a technical advisory board of practitioners and academics from around the world to develop this framework. Now, there's two components to the framework, three principles, and four dimensions. The principles, legitimacy, effectuation, and coordination. Now, the first principle, legitimacy, what does that mean? Legitimacy refers to essentially the degree to which those that are being subjected to rules, norms, standards, the collaborations involved in a governance arrangement, do they deem those collaborations, those norms, rules, and standards to be legitimate when they subject themselves to them, when they participate in them? Effectuation refers to the degree to which there are clear structures, clear procedures, clear processes set in the collaboration and formulation of rules, stand, rules and standards. And coordination finally is a third principle, looking really at the degree to which there's consistency and complementarity between the actions, partnerships, uh, interactions between the actors involved within a sector trying to push that sector towards more sustainable outcomes. Now we take those three principles and apply them to four dimensions. The first, legislation. The second, voluntary codes and standards. Third, collaborative arrangements. And fourth, capabilities. Legislation, I think, speaks for itself. Voluntary codes and standards perhaps also. There we're looking at that level at the interaction between the two. At the next level, collaborative arrangements, we're really looking at how organizations within a sector across public and private uh, actors are collaborating and how those collaborations are essentially enabling and feeding into uh, compliance, but also changes within legislation, codes and standards. And finally, going one level deeper, we look at the capabilities, the capabilities of those actors 
to engage in collaborative arrangements and also, in, again, to engage with legislation, not only for the sake of compliance, but also potentially to shape and change legislation, codes and standards, as well as the collaborative arrangements in a way that will enable them to better achieve sustainability outcomes within the sector. Now, there's a lot of detail on the website. There are two examples I quickly want to run you through. The first is Atlantic salmon from Canada. Again, you can see the dashboard on the website. I'm going to quickly jump across to some of the actionable insights that have emerged from that assessment. What we find within that sector in Canada is essentially strong provincial and federal regulatory structures in place. But what we also find is that they're not always responsive to the challenges that the industry is facing when it comes to key problems in the sector. We also see variation in the scope and interpretation of standards across the country. The standards are there, but we see their interpretation, application, and even the support they're getting from the government as varying, which is creating some inconsistencies across the sector as a whole. What we also see is weak transparency around operational details. So for example, key environmental reports like the British Columbia Viral Management Plan. That weak transparency, of course, feeds into that fourth point there where we're seeing indeed industry taking action to address key issues. However, weak transparency and poor interaction with civil society is meaning that those actions are probably going to be undermined in the long term in terms of their legitimacy. They're simply not going to be seen as legitimate in the eyes of those societal actors because of that weak transparency. Now, these are issues which the sector, the government, the private sector can take up as discussion points, key discussion points in understanding what is limiting their overall capacity to interact with each other and to develop the capabilities necessary for solving the problems that the industry is facing. A second example, shrimp from Myanmar. Again, the detail of all of these, uh, these figures, uh, you can look at at the website. Again, I'm gonna jump across to the actionable insights that emerge from our assessment. What we find in Myanmar is that aquaculture related legislation in this case is outdated and requires reform. What we also find is there's a general lack of authority and organization of implementing legislation and that essentially responsibilities for implementing that legislation is unclear. We also find decision-making processes between the state, the industry and the NGOs as unclear and a, quite a serious lack of transparency, especially around key issues uh, within that industry around land tenure and the management of mangroves. We also see entrenched hierarchies, especially in the Department of Fisheries, which prevents staff from raising concerns and which stifles in turn a culture of problem solving. So again, overall, we see a range of points here which can be taken up by the sector, again, public or private actors, to discuss really what are limiting, what are the factors limiting the interactions necessary, the capabilities necessary for indeed problem solving within that sector to move, even begin in this state, in the case of Myanmar, begin to discuss issues of sustainability uh, into the future. So coming back to our opening question, I believe indeed that governance is a missing ingredient for aquaculture and sustainable aquaculture. And I think it's important for three key things. It's important for addressing the structural limitations for uh, structural limitations to legitimate, credible and more equitable problem solving within a given sector. I think governance is also essential for engaging public and private sector actors in constructive discussion over their joint sustainability impact, their role in achieving sustainability goals. And it's important to enable the sector to assess and anticipate the interactions and capabilities needed for positive social and economic, uh, and of course, environmental outcomes within a given sector. So I look forward very much to the discussion that uh, follows this presentation. And again, there's lots more detail around those examples I've given, uh, as well as the framework. And I do invite you to visit our website, www.aquaculturegovernance.org. And again, I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. I'm Sarah, and I think that the future of aquaculture and governance is really important in building towards a sustainable future. Um, governance can be really, really good for aquaculture, such as with the ASSG and Scottish Shellfish, in um, getting everyone on the same page and getting everyone building towards something that's beneficial and sustainable. But it can also be really hindering to the, to the industry. You can see that in the examples at the moment of the problems we have exporting B-grade live
small student. So governance is really important and it's like a very useful tool for us to have in building our culture, but it has to be used as well. Bangladesh Ecoculture Technology Innovation Platform, BATIP, is a multi-stakeholder platform. The effectiveness of BATIP has significant role in sustainable agriculture development in Bangladesh through its contribution to the development of national strategies, prepare strategic research and innovation agenda, enhance cooperation, coordination among the stakeholders, facilitate research and development projects and program. If I look at the agriculture industry in Africa as a whole, I also think that most people in the industry embrace good governance and sustainable growth. However, there is still a lack of resources within the industry and especially within governments. I think the international community can help uh, local governments in Africa to build up uh, enough resources to be able to implement uh, good governance. Also, I, I feel that for certifying bodies, there should be a shift uh, from the consumer side of things to the more investment side of things. This, together with the whole seminar, will be published after the event on YouTube. So now to briefly introduce the panel. Uh, Randy Bromit, who is a senior fisheries specialist at the World Bank. Han Han, the founder and executive director of China Blue Sustainability Institute. Wendy Norden, science director, Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. Anna Karina Perez Oropeza, strategic development advisor, Forest Stewardship Council International. And, and Dave Robb, who's the program lead for Seafurther, the Cargill Aquaculture Nutrition. So thank you for that. And uh, we'll now move on to asking the panel some questions. And I'm firstly going to ask Wendy um, about some people have the view that governance is something that governments do. So, so why is governance also re relevant for the work of NGOs? Great. Hey, Dave. Thanks for the question. Um, so I work for a program called Seafood Watch, which is part of the Monterey Bay Aquarium. And what we do is assess um, the environmental performance of global aquaculture and fisheries you know, around the world. And so um, when certain benchmarks aren't met, um, you know, we work with a lot of companies around the world that source seafood, some of the largest food service companies, retailers, um, restaurants, chefs. When benchmarks aren't met and they're wanting to source environmentally sustainable seafood, um, improvements have to be made. So we have to really dive in to understand what improvements should be made. But the key to really driving improvements is a good governance structure. So governance is really important when we want to think about improvement um, around the world. Um, and so this is critical to making sure that improvements that we embark on are, um, are able to be um, upheld by the government, uh, enforced, but also uh, with the AGIs that we've been working on with, with Wagenegg and, and, and yourself, we really look at um, how, what is the enabling conditions within a country to drive improvements. So it really is essential to understand not only what improvements have to be made, which is what our assessments do, we kind of have that outcome assessment looking at what is the environmental performance, but really the AGIs look at things like what goes into that. How do we engage? Um, what conditions might exist that may allow improvements to flourish or, or not? And where do we engage in trying to drive improvements? Is it at the governance level? Is it at the production level? Is it at the performance level? And so uh, the AGIs and our work give you a more complete picture, a more holistic view of the sustainability of the industry. You know, essentially, we all want to see a healthy, thriving um, aquaculture industry around the world. And governance is really key for us being able to do our work and key to promoting a really healthy um, industry, essentially. That's great. Um, I wonder, Han Han, if you can give a perspective from China, the organization that you run in China, please. Thank you. Uh, yeah, we are a locally based NGO. Uh, particularly promoting the sustainable fisheries and aquaculture. So in the past of five, six years, we were lucky to have this uh, sponsorship from uh, uh, philanthropic foundations like IDH and other Packer foundations to implement tilapia aquaculture improvement project in China, uh, particularly in Hainan Island. It's a tropical area in, in the South China. And as I read through the 
uh, assessment report from the aquaculture governance indicators for China. All those uh, information, I think it serves a perfect uh, reflection from our, uh, or matching with our uh, experience as well. Um, all these uh, indicates a strong need to um, enable, uh, to build up the enabling conditions and uh, increase the capacity from the overall industry uh, towards the better governance. Um, but on the other hand, I think there, uh, as we all understand the importance of the NGO's uh, role in bridging the gaps between uh, the industry members or industry players and the government, um, there's also um, some uh, preconditions have to be met first. First of all, I think it's the trust relationship between the NGO and all these stakeholders, which really requires a long time of cultivation. And very often, uh, sometimes the, the philanthropic uh, funding um, projects only gives you like a, a one or two years uh, to, to, they want to have the quick results within a sh very short term of time frame, but that's very challenging for building the relationship. And it's also um, a growing of the local culture or the openness in terms of um, the in inclusive process. So the, all these really require a uh, fully, full respect to the local culture, local political uh, context, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Hannah. That's interesting. So relationships are really important. And the private sector, of course, is critical. And perhaps move on to Dave Robb now and, and, and ask, perhaps you can address, Dave, the sustainability issues in aquaculture sector extend beyond production. And could you give us an insight what the role of the private sector plays in addressing sustainability beyond the farm? Thanks, Dave. And yes, I think it's uh, it, it clearly plays a, a great role in, in working here as a, a, from representing a feed company in this discussion here. I'm already an example of how we're, we're going back beyond production, the point of production and farming into, into other sections of inputs in terms of the sustainability of the industry. And although we talk about aquaculture as one industry, it's in fact incredibly diverse and the FAO has confirmed there's over 450 species farmed. And in reality, they say it's probably more than 600 species being farmed in a variety of different systems. And so we're really experiencing a great deal of challenges across the different geographies. And I think as Simon showed in his video, the government's governance already varies greatly between countries. But when you overlap this complexity, it adds to the issues that Han Han just realized, uh, mentioned as well about trust between the players and, and cultural sensitivity, how are we going to address this? So I think the, the AGI's framework that's been um, presented here starts to show how this work can have an impact. But I think really we need, we need to see um, greater involvement in industry to, to lead these solutions going forwards. And, and there are already some really good examples there, but again, because of the diversity and complexity of global operations, it's hard to make broad statements on this, but I can I can give a, a couple of examples that, that are really well recognized and, and some that are coming up as well. So I think working um, in the salmon sector, salmon feed sector, looking at um, our sourcing of marine ingredients to ensure that we're getting them from sustainable supply chains, working with the fisheries and the regulators and key environmental NGOs and stakeholders to to develop sustainably managed fisheries. Uh, we've had some great examples of, of those over the years and, and more recently examples where things that are um, perhaps going backwards in terms of uh, sustainable management of the fishery, typically here in the, in the Northeast Atlantic with blue whiting, herring and mackerel, how can the industry respond to this and, and, and try and create extra incentives or pressure to, to get those fisheries back on track to being sus uh, sustainably managed. Working with an organization called NAPA, the North Atlantic Pelagic Advocacy Group, to, to create advocacy towards the regulators to understand that sustainable fishery is going to be much better for everybody, and particularly the, the um, assessment of environmentally sustainable aquaculture utilizing those fisheries. We're seeing similar examples in soy as well, working with suppliers in Brazil to set deforestation and conversion-free goals. Um, 
but also to to work on a broader landscape methodology to that will will address the bigger um, societal issues and, um, and and start to work to create those equitable solutions that Simon mentioned in his video as well. Last quick mention there as well is is to look at other environmental impacts that, that really stretch across multiple uh, supply chains, such as carbon uh, emissions, and, and working to identify how we can create solutions towards addressing those across uh, multiple supply chains. That's the, the goal of the Sea Further initiative that you mentioned I'm the programme lead for. And, and so I think the, the challenge here is for industry to understand what the impacts are and how we can create um, uh, an ecosystem where we can address those challenges with the relevant stakeholders. Thanks, Dave. Yeah, that's that really gives us a sense of the complexity of someone like yourself is is working within. Randy, from a perspective of a of a development banker, as it were, uh, what, what's your take on this? Well, um, you know, we've been talking a lot about uh, environmental sustainability. I think. Um, but sustainability is multidimensional. And um, from the point of view of an agency that's seeking to facilitate the eradication of poverty, and you know, and here I want to put the emphasis on eradication, not just you know, marginal increases. Um, you know, beyond just growing things that help people have healthier diets and generating taxable profits, you know, the role of the private sector in, in economic and social sustainability is to generate good jobs that can help people especially young people, get on a pathway out of poverty. Um, you know, having said that, the human resource problems that are faced by companies investing in, especially, you know, World Bank client countries, which are poorer countries, are well known and uh, pose serious constraints on the ability of companies to use cutting edge technology and production processes that would, you know, improve the environmental profile, but also get young people excited about aquaculture. Um, uh, you know, a social license to operate is going to depend significantly, I think, on the degree to which the community sees aquaculture as the future of their economy and their children's prosperity. Good. Thank you for that. Um, we would now like to take a, ask a question of, uh, of Anna Karina. Um, uh, sorry, to, to Han Han, is governance is about enabling people in the sector to make changes to how they're producing, processing or selling fish. What role do non-state actors like NGOs play in supporting the capability of producers and companies to, to adopt more sustainable practices in your experience? Okay, thank you. Um, in our experience, we are really sort of like a translator in the first place. When, when we say translating, it's the we, we discovered that um, even though we all speak Chinese or Mandarin, but actually they sh uh, people have different language uh, system. Uh, for example, the, the farmers, when they even speak like the, the unit, it's different from what the, the government or, or the big companies used in, in Mandarin. <coughs> so there's a lot of a technical as well as the uh, uh, more um, uh, multidisciplinary uh, context that really uh, in, requires a lot of communication. And, and this will lead to more transparency. Uh, and uh, secondly, we also play the role of like a, like a coach, I would say. The coach means uh, to introduce the, uh, the sense about inclusiveness. For example, when we help the Hainan local fish farmers and the industry association to de develop their code of good practices, uh, it's, a, it's the first time to think about uh, the consultation, uh, consultation with the stakeholders. For example, when it comes to the sector about the fingerlings, we uh, uh, literally took, took the, the draft of the code of good practices to people working in the hatchery and uh, asking them what's the practical things that happening on the ground. And then they, they talked to us in the oral language, but that also needs to be converted into more formal written language that will be um, allowed to pass the review by the uh, national committee uh, to, you know, to, to review the, the standards, the, the code of good practices. So all these kind of things really required a lot of efforts, 
But unfortunately, uh, the traditional governance system that dominated by the government or uh, people assume that government should take care of everything, they, do, they really have very limited uh, resources, human staff, uh, resource, human resources as well. And they really need more uh, trainings or capacity building in terms of how to communicate uh, with different stakeholders and also uh, to streamline or institutionalize that kind of uh, process. So okay. there's a lot of things to do for the sort of education role. <laughs> Interesting. That's a that's a really interesting insight into that process in in China. I wonder, Anna Karina, could could you perhaps uh, complement that from your your background in the world of forest? Thank you. So, building on what Han 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 has said, um, I would like to to bring the perspective of the value chain dynamics and how we have learned in the forestry sector how this works, the downstream and the upstream logic and how the NGOs play, play a key role here. And with a multiplier effect, I would say, at the downstream level, um, NGOs have the potential to target retailers and brands who are maybe not directly linked to unsustainable practices, but connected to the consumer, to the citizen, and also having the purchasing power to decide the requirements uh, that the products they sell will have. And a very good example is the case of zero deforestation agenda that started in the 2000s, in which basically international NGOs targeted retailers and um, the value chain at the downstream downstream side as a driver of deforestation. Um, this is a, a, an area of research that I'm really passionate about and it is interesting to hear how some NGOs so this was more effective than targeting the, the upstream level of the supply chain um, as they saw it as a driver for change. So this even though the problem of deforestation hasn't been solved, there are some interesting collaboration dynamics in which NGOs are somehow uh, collaborating with players in the value chains. And the second dimension uh, complements to what Han Han, of course, ha has said um, this role of NGOs as translators, as really bringing different languages together, the technical capacity, and um, I, I see two roles here because also I come from the sustainability standards world. NGOs provide a very good input to raise the bar. And as um, she said, also they are key enablers for, for the effectiveness of the standards to actually happen on the ground. Great. So, so to take that further, the forestry sector is arguably further ahead in addressing governance issues that affect sustainability than the aquaculture sector. What, what lessons can you bring in addition to the ones you just mentioned from your work at the Forest Stewardship Council that would be useful for aquaculture, Anna Karina? Yes, um, so just as a reminder, FSC is an international organization that promotes responsible forest management of the forest, and it is widely recognized by its certification system, the check tree label that you can see in my background, uh, found on products and verifying a sustainable path from the forest to the markets. Um, I would like to structure my answer on two um, legitimacy dimensions and try to link it also with, with the way you are seeing it also and trying to see um, synergies with the aquaculture sector. And the input legitimacy part, which is a level of participation and inclusion of views, FSC's governance since in its inception has embraced the notion of sustainability, this three-dimensional aspect of social, economic, and environmental perspective brought together to find solutions to global challenges. So th this is something that the solution dimension of uh, FSC's governance. And um, these FSC members are grouped in chambers and uh, representing social, economic, and environmental. And um, balancing, balancing these um, solutions through compromises and creating a benchmark for forest stewardship. So it's very common in FSC to see an indigenous representative talking to a senior manager from a big firm or company and an environmental NGO, having a discussion together and balancing really what the solution needs to be, the compromise. Um, this happens at the local and uh, global level. And a bit technically speaking, FSC has global principles and criteria which principle one is uh, being compliant with laws that are transferred through international generic indicators. So FSC has IGIs. 
And these indicators translate um, into national stewardship standards that are developed and agreed by local stakeholders. So it's like really a transfer process in which all stakeholders uh, participate at the different levels. And, um, and well, maybe at the global level, this means biodiversity or a social aspect at the local level. It's really specific. It could get to spe certain species or to even certain safeguards for workers' rights. This is, this is something FSC has built over the years and made stronger. And then at the um, output legitimacy and connecting a bit with the effectuation and coordination dimensions I've heard um, today, um, which is about the effectiveness of the goals and how you actually achieve them. Um, FSC has found a way to connect this participation with actual act uh, action on the ground. And um, has developed, FSC has developed a system that has connected governance with forest and the actual functioning of markets. And, um, and the fact that Forests are, are in an ecosystem and forestry is a sector, of course, helps in this regard. But um, just to conclude, um, I think my, my lesson learned from the forestry sector or my advice is also what is the joint final destination? Where in the landscape? And what are the key enabler, enablers and what systems need to be in place uh, for sustainable aquaculture? So thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Santa Karina. Dave, Dave, Rob, you you represent your you represent Aqua, but I think broader a livestock perspective. And I'm wondering what we can learn what we can learn from those sectors in in, in terms of uh, where we need to go in terms of aquaculture governance to add to Anna Karina's uh, impact here. I think um, some of the the points that Anna Karina made there are really pertinent to to aquaculture feed, also still livestock feed as well broadly, where we need to understand what the goal is and how we're going to, what are the levers for change there? And unless we've agreed on the goal and, and, and there's a question in the chat, is that how broad are all the goals and utterly recognizing the importance of various goals, but we, as industry, we need to have guidance on what the priorities are and how, how we're going to focus on those and, and deliver those changes. And then we have to get the support through the various actors in that um, to, to deliver that. I think this is the challenge where, where, where industry is um, arriving at the moment. Ha what are the focus points that we've got to deliver on? And I think to deliver this multi-stakeholder approach that FSC has talked about here is, is great to start to, to engage in the topics, uh, understand the levers for change and, and develop that prioritisation. Because without that, we get lots of disparate initiatives and pilot projects that might go, go here and there, but we could be missing the, the big picture here and, and also the big opportunities for change if we, if we focus in, in the wrong regions or the wrong, the wrong markets. Mm. Thank, thanks, Dave. Yeah, convening, convening power, how you bring stakeholders together, it, it just seems to be such an essential thing. And I wonder if Randy, Randy Brummett can now, you know, give us some insights as some perhaps some examples from the, the work of World Bank as a as a donor, as a financer, you do have that role of convening. Um, can you give us some some insights, please, Randy? Sure. Let me first say that, you know, um, you know, there's no such thing as a World Bank project. You know, we the World Bank finances uh, government projects. So since World Bank loans go to governments to implement their projects. Um, all of our investments naturally have a large com governance component. And, um, you know, aquaculture is a, a private sector <clears throat> business, but establishing and enforcing clear rules and lines of responsibility um, within the government and legally binding rights um, for the private sector is, is crucial for attracting responsible investment. Um, you know, at the, at, the, at the broader policy level, we need to sort of differentiate governance from politics. You know, we have, um, you know, politicians, we interact with, you know, senior government people and um, UN agencies and, and multilateral uh, investment firms and donors. And, you know, politicians with encouragement from thought leaders in, in these various agencies often take you know, high-minded public positions on issues that are um, extremely important. 
um, but go well beyond the ability of the regulators in our client states um, to implement anything. And um, you know, as Han Han mentioned earlier, you know, that there's um, you know fisheries departments often suffer from uh, a lack of human resource capacity and ability to implement really you know these um, government projects that have a wide range of, of stakeholders involved and um, different people with different issues that are um, you know want their aspect of sustainability um, to be featured in these in in our our, our project lending um, you know, it's understandable. It's hard to make a living as a mid-level bureaucrat in, in what are often underfinanced ministries um, that depend by and large on short-term donor funding. And, uh, you know, where the priorities change every couple of years and are impossible to fully incorporate, you know, oftentimes the, the projects or, the, or the, the project just getting it started takes longer than the lifespan of the development jargon that we uh, that's constantly evolving. Um, you know, to try to address these these problems, uh, we regard training as a, as an input, um, um, but it, not an output. Um, we're, we're constrained by the our lending cycle, which is typically about five years, um, and we emphasize measurable impacts on poverty. So any training that takes you know capacity building that takes more than a few months. Um, can seriously hamper um, our ability to implement um, because, you know, key people that are needed are are not in place. And uh, when it comes to the execution of the project, um, the time gets shortened if you take the key people out and send them away for training for two years. So having said that, we do have a mechanism called development policy operations, and they have uh, more long-term institution building objectives and do offer a significantly more scope for human resource and other capacity building in, in governance. Um, and uh, we have a, a uh, some um, in Cabo Verde, for example, we have a what we call a DPO um, that's working on the aquaculture uh, legislation. And it includes, it, a lot of it is about um, environmental sustainability of the sector. Um, you know, on the downside for us, you know, so, you know governance, there's a, a, there's a minimum amount of governance that's essential. And, um, but when you get, you know, these governments, governance systems um, that are implemented by a wide variety of different people with different, you know, perspectives and point of views, you know, some of these people have been elected, many of them are self-designated and they can j- make projects extremely complicated. And, you know, many of you may have heard this, you know, there's an old saying in the development community, the likelihood of a project being successful is inversely proportional to the number of times the word cooperation appears in the project document. You know, the more that, you know, uh, these, these very popular ecosystems and blue economy approaches um, internalize complexity or try to, um, the greater the need for interagency cooperation coordination and the greater the likelihood that the process um, of implementing a project can, can overtake uh, progress against poverty alleviation. So, it, you know, it's some of each. Um, too much can be a bad thing. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Randy. So, so as a, a financier, it's, it's certainly more complicated than money. But I wonder how, Wendy, from your perspective, uh, running a science program in an NGO, wh- where, where's the financial impacts for you? Where, where does finance work in improving governance, do you think? Yeah, it's a really important point. And, you know, obviously there's never enough money right out there. So I think, you know, it, it's a really important point. And I, I think in terms of financing governance and aquaculture improvement, you know, I think it's always very risky, right? So a lot of, a lot of financiers, it's very uh, risky operations. So I think it's our role, one of our roles to really understand the improvements needed, um, be more directed um, and sort of de-risk that um, operation for getting finance where, where we can. And I think working at all these different levels in terms of understanding the environmental performance, but also knowing, going back to what Randy said earlier, it isn't just about environmental performance. It's about the people involved. It's about um, getting value back into the system. It's about locking in improvement 
and, and understanding the governance structure and what areas need improvement. Is it cooperation? Is it the uh, legislative piece? Is it allowing the conditions to exist within a country to create change and adapt to change? And so all these things and knowing all these pieces helps you to understand where to, where to invest, how and how to make that a less risky operation essentially as well. So I think these are all really important pieces um, to understanding how we drive improvement at all the different levels, at the social level and also the environmental level. Thanks, thanks Wendy. So we, we're gonna pick up on some of the questions that are coming hard and fast through the Q and A. And as I think you've been uh, instructed, you've been voting on them and we've got some, some hot favorites here that I'm gonna ask of the panel now. Um, first is uh, that I like to address maybe uh, this is something that Dave Robb, maybe Han Han can pick up on, is how important is it that farmers and farming companies really understand the impacts of individual and joint initiatives on the ecosystem? The concept of ecosystem carrying capacity seems still far from being well understood um, and, and far from view and is often the case with governing institutions as well. Thanks, Dave. I think that's a it's a great question from Doris there, and and I, I you know the opportunities to collaborate between companies are uh, seem distant at first, but then I think where they, the the work's been done to pull them together, and, and we highlighted the Global Salmon Initiative earlier as a great example where big companies are able to work together on common goals. Uh, throughout all of their operating sites as well. And I think that really does show that there is this opportunity to work together and create change at scale that really um, does impact uh, uh, in a positive way the, the, the issues that we're seeking to address. I think where it, it becomes difficult is where there are lots of uh, farmers who haven't got that uh, background of, of collaboration and, and setting up the GSI took a long time and a lot of work behind the scenes to get those companies to collaborate. Uh, farmers don't traditionally collaborate often on, on many issues. So how do, you, how do you get them together? How do you enable that? It's a point that's come up various times during today. And then of course, how, what are you aligning on? What, what, what can you set up in a way that's easy for them to understand? How can you deliver them capabilities to drive that change and succeed and keep moving forward? So small incremental steps are, are going to be much easier for the farmers to uh, to address and, and succeed on and then make the next steps rather than setting up huge goals which sometimes are, are what's needed but you need to break it down for industry to be able to work on okay thanks thanks for that second second question i think this is one from dan lee private standards are continually being pushed to include more requirements for example of late there's been campaigns to raise requirements for animal welfare. More complex standards are difficult and costly for producers in some countries to meet. Should standards become more complex or resist the pressure from campaigners? Not sure who'd like to have a, have a shot at that one. Maybe Han Han, uh, from your perspective, you know, I, I think there's, there is pushback in countries where farmers are not big corporations and yeah, the, the ability to meet these to meet standards is often a, a, a challenge for them. Could you have a pop on that one? Yeah, I, I think uh, personally, I, I would have um, um, a bit suspect uh, about um, the involvement of uh, involvement of the standards itself become more and more complicated and adding extra cost and pressure on the overall the producer's shoulder. And I, I think uh, if we take China as an example, the seafood species ha have been, you know, pr uh, those being produced uh, in China really crossed a lot of different categories and each have in very unique uh, farming model and according to the local environment, social and natural environment. So it really requires a, a more uh, level of flexibility and I think it's very important to give the local producers sort of the ownership of those uh, um, best practices. It's, it's really about how to motivate them to um, be more actively engaged in implementing this. So rather than just um, imposing those established standards or uh, requirements, 
I think it's very important from the beginning to engage them when you want to start something new or adding something more. <laughs> I think it's uh, it's really about uh, showing the respect to their local uh, in conditions. Um, we we I I really doubt that we have all the know how at the at all the time. I think it's very important to listen to those producers in in the first place. Yeah. Okay. Um, I wonder if if Randy, you've got anything to add to that. Um. Not a whole lot, but I, I would I would reiterate what what Han Han just said. Um, uh, it it can be extremely. It, you can you can put people out of business um, by uh, over regulating them, and there I you know, and a lot of the regulations that we we um, you know, try to enforce um, sometimes are overlapping. And I, I think we could do a better job of simplifying um, the requirements, in fact, um, cooking it down to what we really, really care about. Um, I think the ASC, for example, last time I counted had 267 control points in it. And, you know, that to me just seems excessive. Um, I, I think you could, you could definitely trim it down, um, make it easier, um, concentrate on the things that we really care about. And, uh, you, know, uh, you know, let's not overregulate it and end up throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, okay, agreed, yeah. I mean, there's one, there's one suggestion in the, in the chat about whether the SDGs are a, a, a good model, a good model that, that I think uh, standards should, should sort of try and frame. But a question here from, from Antonymic, these assessments are at national level, but often governance is much more local. Do you think that assessments that, that support governance can be delivered at different scales? Wendy, what, what's your view on that? Yes, absolutely. Um, you know, when we were developing the AGIs, we developed it in that with that in mind. Like it could be, they can be used at any level. So mm. at the national country production level. So, so that's really, I think it's really important because um, what it gets at is, you know, there's obviously could be really important pieces that we're missing. If we look at the country level, when you look at more of a regional level or even a production system. So they can be used at any scale or scope, which I think is really important. Mm, thanks. And one about Africa here about, and I think this came on the, on the video mashup about resources in poorer countries. And, and, and really one, again, for you, Randy, you, you say that you, the World Bank doesn't have projects. It, it supports national projects. Will, will that become relatively more important, the, the focus on good governance in, in, in sub-Saharan Africa, for example, to support the, the growing industry? Um, you know, the capacity of the government to do a whole lot um, is very limited. And, um, you know, Africa has it worse. You know, I, I had one minister that once asked me um, when we were trying to get aquaculture going in a particular country, she said, why should I invest in it? I have real industries. I got a dairy industry, I got a beef industry, I got goats and cows and chickens and all these things. Why should I invest my limited resources in a sector that doesn't exist? Um, what we are trying to uh, get our uh, client governments to do in the context of World Bank projects is to um, regulate them in such a way that it, it you know, they um, capture the, the the essence of what they need to do um, without trying to over over stretch their ability. They can work on um, policy uh, a policy environment that could stimulate the kind of responsible private sector people that they want to have in the country um, by ignoring um, the governance uh, component. Um, we've seen this happen in a number of different countries. Um, you know, sometimes politicians adopt this, you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it approach and will let a, a, an industry just run rampant um, and then get into big trouble. And then you have to retrofit, um, which is also beyond the capacity of government. So, um, like I said before, I think there is an important role for government, but they have to keep it down to what they can actually do. And that and simplifying the regulations, making them clear, and then enforcing them would help a lot. 
Thanks. There's there's a whole load of great questions. I mean, one from Musa Usman. Uh, it, you know, he's looking for guidance on how he can make his own contributions in the context of Nigeria, where it, where he's saying it's completely absent. So so please stay on. Um, we're going to finish on the dot. I hope at. Uh, in a few minutes time, but we're going to keep it open for the Q&A and the panel are going to stick around. So there'll be more opportunities to to answer and get answers to some of these uh, these questions. I'd like to really uh, thank uh, the panel uh, to Firkin and Hilda, who've been taking the Q&As together with Simon behind the scenes. And just before we wrap up, I'd now like to introduce uh, Eddie Allison, who's the Director of Science and Research in Aquatic Food Systems of Wellfish, to provide some closing rem remarks uh, of, of the whole session, please, uh, Eddie. Uh, thanks very much. Um, hello, good evening, everyone. And, and thanks, Dave, and thanks everyone for such a, a fascinating discussion. Um, rather a difficult one to summarize, so I'll just uh, go through some um, impressions and I guess uh, key points that I took away and, and perhaps even more questions for you to, um, to address or to think about. Um, I think the message that governance is much more complicated than what governments do came across very clearly and the roles of um, NGOs in the private sector um, extensively debated there. And, you know, a question that occurred to me from that debate was, and, and the topic of this was, uh, is there a, a governance deficit in aquaculture? Or is it that there's a, a sort of um, an aqua aquaculture governance um, research shortfall? So there's a lot going on clearly in aquaculture governance. Are we learning about it, studying it, um, and helping to improve it fast enough? Is enough aquaculture research directed towards um, addressing the um, governance challenges that, that have come to light uh, during this, this discussion? Um, with the proviso that, you know, if you have improved, um, if you have directed research that can help you improve and optimize your governance system, then that might be a cost-effective way to improve um, aquaculture governance. Um, the framework that, um, that Simon introduced at the beginning, I think, um, was interesting because, you know, like all frameworks, it has to hit the balance between uh, a generalizability of principles and flexibility, sufficient flexibility to accommodate uh, all the different circumstances of aquaculture um, around the world. And we heard some of those different circumstances and some of the arguments for and against different, different approaches. And it struck me then that, um, you know, what's, what's important, I think, in, in the design of any governance system is, is to understand the political economy um, of the particular place and sector that you're, that you're addressing. And, you know, whether there is in um, the uh, aquaculture governance indicators and tools that... Uh, that the group are developing, whether there is this, this sort of political economy analysis, rather like, for example, the bank, I don't know if they still do this, but they used to do these sort of growth diagnostics, um, which look at the binding constraints for growth and look at the, the sort of governance solutions to, to addressing those, uh, whether at sectoral level, there's, there's a kind of um, systematized process that, that could accompany this, this uh, governance indicators exercise. Um, to tailor the solutions because of the different approaches and pathways, you know, I suspect that people's buy into, for example, you know, civil society led initiatives to govern or government led uh, regulatory processes and incentives or private sector led, led development and, and governance and standards pretty much depends on what kind of politics there are at play in that place. And often, somewhat, the, the, the politics of the individual analyst comes into play as well in terms of what is a favoured um, solution. Um, so I think, you know, there's a, a need to take the, the, this broad toolbox and to look at it through that lens of political economy, I think, um, to come up with tailor-made solutions um, of the kind that I think everyone is looking for to help the industry grow, not be over-regulated, um, not to throw out the carp with the wastewater, as Randy nearly said, um, and 
uh, you know, to allow this uh, important sector to contribute to food security in productive ways. Thanks very much, Eddie. That, that's a, a, a really a well thought through summary, I think. And I'd like to just end this session by thanking everyone, the today's panel that you've all met uh, for their interesting input. Of course, for, for Wageningen and, and Monterey Bay Aquarium, who have partnered up on this. Um, we'll be back in in the autumn with a, another short series of, of seminars. We hope we can you can join us. And, and the, the whole purpose of these is for us in aquaculture to get out of our bubble, to learn from other sectors in the, the world of natural resources and, and broader food systems and try and make that link stronger. I'd particularly like to thank Susan Fitz, Armand Sturm, and Alex Pounds, my colleagues here at Sterling, for helping putting this together. And I'd urge you to stay on if you have the time to continue in the Q&A for another hour or so. And some of the panel members will be staying around to, to, to help that process. And in the meantime, thanks very much. See you next time.